Hello, everybody. This is Stacy Kruzik from the Dev Relations team here at Zebra Technologies. Welcome to our Dev Talk today in terms of what's new for Android or on Android Oreo for Zebra developers. Uh, before we begin and let Darren take over, um, he's our resident expert today. I just wanted to go through a couple of things with you and some announcements. First of all, you'll see on the screen we have at Forum 2019, that is next year, our um, Every other year event is going to be kicking off next year. We'll be in Warsaw first, following with Sydney, Singapore, and then Las Vegas. Uh, we'd love for you to attend. This is for all developers and tech leaders. Um, and if you'd like to uh, pre-register, we should have that site live and ready to go in November. So watch for that. Um, you can certainly get announcements on that and learn more about that if you're part of our Zebra developer portal. Um, we'd love to have you participate in that and receive news and events information. Um, you can do that by going to developer.zebra.com and register at any time. Last but not least, um, a couple of housekeeping items for today. Uh, for any of questions that may come up uh, that arise, uh, you can type those ahead in the, in the question box, but we'll wait till the end of the presentation. Um, I'll share those with Darren and he can respond uh, to those for you. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Darren if you're ready to go. Okay, thank you very much, Stacy. Just a reminder to, to start the recording uh, after what we were saying before the call. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be talking over some of the changes which have happened in Android Oreo, if I can get the slides working here, uh, and their impact on Zebra or enterprise developers. Uh, so the second time I've done one of these talks, and the talk I gave for Marshmallow and Nougat went down quite well, so we thought it would be a good idea to do a similar thing for Oreo and just go over some of the changes which have been introduced into the platform. I'm a software architect here at Zebra Technologies. I also do a lot of developer relations, so if there's any uh, opportunities to uh, come to the App Forum events, and I look forward to meeting a lot of you there. Uh, the agenda, I do I will very briefly go over our GMS restricted feature. This is something which has been introduced in our new devices, the TC52, 57, 72, 77, PS20, which have been announced very recently. These are shipping with Oreo out of the box, hence the, the timing of this dev talk. It is a soft launch. It's a feature which we will be adding to over the coming releases and we'll probably be doing a, a dev talk in the new year about it but I just wanted to introduce the concept here because it is new and specific to Oreo and then the bulk of the presentation will be taking a look at some of the changes which have come into Oreo introduced by Google. So GMS restricted then, what is it? Uh, it is a new feature that we, Zebra, have added to our platform and it restricts the device's ability in two ways. First of all, it restricts the device's ability to communicate with Google. So if you are coming from an AOSP environment, from a non-GMS device, and you're considering moving or upgrading to a GMS portfolio or a GMS device, and you have those concerns over the device phoning home to Google or calling, you know, sending packets to Google, then GMS restricted is a way to uh, mitigate those concerns. It does come with some, you know, so you, you can't get something without taking something else away. So the drawback is that the capabilities of the device are somewhat reduced because how it works, you or we are disabling the GMS applications and services available on the device. And we'll go into a lot of more detail of this in, in the coming uh, documentation when, when we publish that about this feature. Uh, but essentially, because you don't have GMS apps available, then what you can do with the device is more restricted, but you, you have that privacy trade-off uh, because then you know that no data is leaving the device destined for Google. So I just got a very brief demonstration. This is, well, it's actually a mock-up because uh, this it's actually a TC51, but imagine this is a TC52 on the screen here. So before you can see there's some some GMS apps and there's little Google icons on the home screen, whereas after you've applied GMS restricted, all those icons, the services go away. I've got a very brief video demo to show that in action. So this is the device in the before state. 
the applications are there. You can see if I just scroll down quickly, we've got things like Chrome, Drive, Hangouts, Maps, the Play Store, Play Music, Play Movies, YouTube, Photos. All of this is available on the device out of the box, adding value and functionality to the device. Uh, if we scan the staging barcode to apply GMS restricted, this is how you apply the feature as part of your staging. Then you'll see all of those apps and services that are running in the background, things like the location service have disappeared. The keyboard there at the top has been replaced with the AOS keyboard, AOSP keyboard, but nothing else has been replaced. So it, it's up to you as the administrator to then augment the device. Let's say you need something to replace the Chrome browser, which has been disabled. At this point in the features lifecycle, it's up to you to uh, apply a, a new browser, maybe a third party browser that you've sourced and you, you have the APK for. Uh, so that's GMS restricted. Uh, Moving on then uh, to the changes that we have uh, introduced or that Google rather have introduced in Oreo. These are features which I wanted to call out that developers for, for our devices or for any enterprise device, uh, to be honest, need to be aware of. So I put this hero slide together. Like I say, I've been talking about this kind of topic since lollipop and marshmallow days. And we've noticed a number of trends over time. So the trends are the, the rows here. Uh, so just restricting what the application can do in the background. And this is one of the, the major topics that we'll be covering in this presentation. This, this seems to introduce new restrictions on background apps or new APIs to help apps manage their power in the background, uh, more things are added in, in each release and background restrictions was added in Oreo. In Android Pie, we see things like uh, machine learning apps stand by buckets and apps are added to those buckets and you know come back in in, in the future and we'll, we'll discuss those. But for today, we'll be talking about the background restrictions added in Oreo. Notifications tend to get a change to their look and feel, maybe some functionality is added, maybe new ways to access the notifications or interact with them for your users and uh, it's, it, you need to understand how that might affect how you're using notifications in your enterprise app. There tends to be a couple of other enterprise specific changes uh, like back in the marshmallow days we had support for single use devices whereas I've got a slide later on in this deck I'm just going to talk over the Google Play Store policy changes and we'll well we'll get to that towards the end. Uh, okay, so that was the, an introduction into like, the, what, the trends. If you want more information, I would thoroughly recommend reading Google's documentation on everything that they add in each new release of Android. This presentation is really designed to augment that information that Google already put together. It's a, it's a great resource. I know it's, it's an awful lot to read, but it's, it's well worth the read. There are also blogs, I noticed just this morning that there was one published yesterday talking about how you should uh, architect your application to run in the background. And it, it, it talks about some of, a lot of the principles which I was covering in this deck here. So I thought it was worth just linking to Google's uh, developer blog there as well. There is uh, additional documentation aimed at EMM partners, which Google publishes separately. And I've put the links there. They've started doing that since NuGet and they, they republish it every time we have a new version of Android. And Zebra, um, by Zebra, it's, it's mostly me writing this stuff, to be honest, but we also publish documentation each new release to say what's new for Marshmallow NuGet. And uh, I've just released the Oreo version of that documentation around seven to 10 days ago, I think it was. So that's up on the developer portal now. But again, all of these slides will be available afterwards if you need these links. Uh, so please do take a look. So Google, uh, so when, when Google talk about what's new in Oreo, this is the list that I managed to get from their website. And they talk about things like picture in picture and wide gamut color and, and uh, media features. And a lot of these are you know, great features in and of themselves. I'm not belittling the features at all, but they really are aimed at consumers. Uh, so it's, it's worth just understanding what actually has been added that may well affect your enterprise applications. And there's not too much there. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of touch on some of these briefly at the end of the presentation. But the main change in Oreo is, in all honesty, background limitations. Um, speaking to 
a lot of our customers in the past who had challenges when Google introduced Doze Mode and then there was the changes to Doze Mode in Nougat. I know Doze Mode was a major concern in Marshmallow Nougat and so I would imagine that background limitations are going to be a concern in Oreo as well or, or in Oreo in addition to the previous uh, restrictions. Uh, there's three main types of restriction. Uh, Google will sort of break this out into two types, but I think it makes more sense to sort of list them as, as three different types of restriction. The first one is receiving implicit broadcast intents that have been declared in the manifest, and we'll go through each of these uh, one by one into a lot more detail. Limitations, what an application can do uh, in its services when it's running in the background and how frequently an application can come to learn it, the location of the device on which it's running. And uh, just a note there, these restrictions do continue uh, into P as well. There's more more restrictions coming is, is what I'm trying to say. And so it's, it's always worth trying to work with these changes, work with the recommendations from Google rather than trying to work against them. And we'll we'll come up to those when we see some of the mitigations in later slides. Oh, and that's oh, that was my final bullet point here. So taking these one by one then, we the first one is applications cannot receive implicit broadcast intents which they have declared in their manifest. And there's a break let's break that down into its constituent components. So first of all, what is an implicit intent? This causes confusion for a lot of people, which I've, I've spoken to both the, in, in and out of the company. But the, the difference here, I thought the simplest way to just was to give a side by side comparison. An implicit intent is an intent which can be resolved by multiple applications. And an explicit intent is an intent which can only be received, uh, resolved by a specific package. So on the right here, that intent can only be resolved by Google Maps. On the left, you could conceivably uh, think of other applications, like maybe you had Bing, if, if there is a, a Bing APK for Android, uh, Bing Maps or uh, TomTom Maps, for example, you could have that running on your Android device and conceivably it would understand a geo URI and it would be able to, to um, listen for that intent and show it in the application. Uh, whereas uh, an explicit intent would only resolve to Google Maps. So the other portion of the limitation broadcast intents, I think that's far better understood. So a broadcast intent is sent out to anyone who cares to listen for it. And you can have multiple receivers for multiple broadcast intents and multiple applications can listen to the intent that you've sent out via broadcast. So the, the obvious question is, is it a a contradiction to have an explicit broadcast intent because you're only sending it to a single receiver and at the same time it's broadcast. So you know, what, what does that really mean? Uh, it, so semantically, maybe that doesn't make too much sense, but technically, yes, you can have a explicit broadcast intent. And there are a couple of instances that Google call out in their APIs where you, you know, explicit broadcast intents exist, um, like uh, package installed, I think, is, is one of them off the top of my head. Uh, so the other part of the limitation was that the restriction declared in the manifest. So you can't have this intent receiver declared in the manifest. That looks like the left-hand side where you're, you're declaring the receiver, you're declaring the action. It's In this case, this is from Google's example that they gave in their documentation, Wi-Fi state changed. This, this um, uh, this intent would not be received because uh, in, when the app is in the background, because it's been declared in the manifest. The other way of registering to receive a broadcast intent is dynamically. So typically you would do this in on resume, you would register your broadcast receivers. So now your apps are in the foreground uh, and your broadcast receivers are, are active. And then when you get an on pause, you would call unregister receivers so that you're no longer receiving these, these um, broadcast when you're in the background. Obviously, that does leave the use case of you know, how do I receive broadcasts when I'm in the background? And we, it's one of the one of the things which this is trying to avoid is that use case. So working around that, we'll talk about the mitigations in a, in a future slide. So how does this affect enterprise applications? So thinking about Zebra devices specifically, we have a few tools for our uh, for our administrators and our developers, which use implicit intents, which will be impacted by this. 
data edge on the left hand side there um, forgive the screenshot that was just from a previous dev talk I gave but I'm trying to indicate here that you can send broadcast intents with data wedge and there's no way of specifying explicit broadcast intent so all of your broadcast data wedge intents will be implicit so just watch out for that if you're currently expecting to receive those in the background after you've registered in the manifest for them uh, on the right there is stage now so the intent csp is uh, only available through the stage now tool and it allows an administrator the ability to send a an intent as part of the staging process of the device and here you can specify the broadcast action but there is no way of specifying the package so again using the intent csp all of those in broadcast intents created will be implicit intents so what are the mitigations so the first one is to use a dynamic broadcast receiver i have i have uh, sort of seen in the past that people will use a dynamic broadcast receiver but then not unregister for it when the app goes into the background and there's always a danger there that your your application will be killed by the android operating system so it, it's not a reliable way of ensuring that you will always receive that broadcast when you're in the background uh, you could switch to an explicit intent like i discussed previously calling sat package that does require you to have control over the sender uh, another way of mitigating this is to target your application at API level 25 or lower. API level 25 is the Android NuGet 7.1 API. Uh, it, it, it will work. Now, uh, there's problems if you continue to take that course of action moving forward, uh, specifically around the, the Play Store application version requirements and we will we'll come to those at the end of the deck google do have a, another suggestion which is to use a scheduled excuse me a scheduled job to check for the condition that would have triggered the implicit broadcast to me that sounds an awful lot like polling uh so yeah maybe that is a, a situation that would work for you in your use case but i expect the use cases would be in the minority where that mitigation would would uh, would work um, of course if if you're using um, if you're using data wedge you could switch to using a send a start activity intent rather than a broadcast intent that would be another mitigation depending on your use case so moving on then to the second of the three limitations it's where we start talking about background services so in oreo uh, if you have a background service in your app so um, maybe you're using an intent service or maybe you're triggering a, a service to be run after you have issued a pending intent um, you know the service is defined within the pending intent if your application is in the background then the service will only be given a window of several minutes and I've added the emphasis on this slide there the Google keeps it a little bit vague in their documentation but the the application service only has this limited time in which it can run uh, and after that then the service gets stopped by the android system so the the idea of this is to stop services running in the background for a long time taking up battery and the the use case for a service now is to just do a very specific job for that, that is designed to last a short period of time and if it's going to last any longer then you should be using one of the uh, the other I think it's called work manager APIs or intent the job intent service APIs in, we'll get to that in the mitigation slide uh, so again there's an awful lot in this limitation to break down so I, I thought I'd start this off by saying well let's look at the definition of a service so uh, I found it it's one of those those things that I found quite difficult to define so I went to the Android docs and I, it, I read there, um, a service is an Android application component that can perform long running operations in the background and doesn't provide a UI. Uh, so I've said that definition needs updating because of these changes in Oreo. Uh, now services, we don't want them to perform long running operations in the background because they'll be stopped after several minutes. And this whole point about providing a UI, this is when we start talking about foreground services and background services. So uh, a foreground service uh, is a service which presents a UI component to the user. So this would be a notification. 
the, the screenshot I'm showing there is a foreground service which is playing music using Google Play Music. Another example might be the Maps application. If it's providing turn-by-turn -turn navigation, you will see it's using a foreground service to, to display those, uh, those navigation. Foreground services are not considered to be in the background. So the application is not in the background if it has a foreground service and therefore it is not subject to any of these background restrictions that we're talking about. Uh, so some customers will, uh, they, they'll call it a dirty hack and they'll, they'll have a foreground service that essentially just says, ignore me, I'm running in the background. That, that will work, but it's not a great experience for the user because they'll have this long running notification that they, they, they just can't get rid of because you know, the developer has made it appear so that their app never goes to sleep. Uh, so that's you know, one mitigation, but uh, that's, hopefully that defines all of these terms that we're talking about in foreground, um, the background services, sorry. Uh, there's this other, other line in the definition that talks about the application has to be built with API level 26 or higher. So you might think, well, similar to, to what we were speaking about with the broadcast intents and the manifest, you know, could I just keep my API target level at 25 and call it a day? Would that be sufficient here? Um, the answer is no. It's, uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it here. You need to be aware that in Oreo, there's an additional option presented as part of the battery usage settings screen if the application targets API level 25 or lower, and if the user is able to access the battery usage screen here, and they do that, they go to settings, uh, and then app info, and then click on battery usage. And there's, there's honestly an awful lot of ways that they can get to this screen. I think you can long press on an application and then go to the application info and, and click on battery usage that way. It's, it's difficult to, to to sort of enumerate all of the different ways to get to this screen. Uh, essentially, the user has the ability to, even though you targeted your, a, your app to API level 25, they can still switch that, um, that switch there to false, and then your application will still be subject to the Oreo background restrictions. It will still have its services stopped after, quote, several minutes of running in the background. So if you are going to target API level 25 to prevent the uh, services being killed, then just make sure you've also prevented your user from accessing this battery usage screen. There's, there's an awful lot of ways you can do that. You can use enterprise home screen, you can use MX and um, specify a, uh, the access manager. You can stop the settings showing that way. I've got a whole post on the developer portal that goes through the different ways of, of locking down your settings. Uh, so a little bit more about this limitation. If you read the Google documentation, they'll talk about a, a temporary whitelist. Uh, your applications will be added to a temporary whitelist for several minutes in order to handle common background tasks. And then you can use uh, Firebase Cloud Messaging or, or SMS. So just be aware there that that whitelist is not the same as the whitelist which was being spoken about in the doze mode context. There's two different whitelists and it, it gets a little bit confusing. Uh, so there are APIs to add your application to the doze mode whitelist that Zebra have exposed, but we do not have anything to add yourself to this background limitation whitelist. So again, be aware of that. And Google will, will list the, the mitigation of user Firebase cloud message to wake the device up to perform some asynchronous task that is a really good thing to do if you're if you're having running a GMS device and the device has access to the cloud, which I know is not all of our customers by any means, but it is an increasing number of our customers to be honest. Then Firebase cloud messaging is a, is a great solution. It's really easy to get started, and it has the benefit that it's the Google recommended way. So when all these changes in Android Pie come along, you're be laughing if you've already transitioned to FCM because you don't have to do anything about background tasks at that point because your app will just continue to work um, as designed. Um, so, oh, I've, okay, and then I've already covered this list. This is just going over that the whitelist exists in multiple contexts, but it's a different whitelist. 
So how does this affect enterprise applications? Uh, so we have a number of customers who are like running their own versions of push messaging just based on an MQTT system. Those apps will be affected by this, this change in, in background services. Essentially anything that was previously affected by those mode uh, and you, you may have worked around that or used our APIs to add your app to the whitelist there, you may well come across issues now as you move to Oreo and you come across these background restrictions. So definitely retest your app in Oreo and I've got testing on the next slide. Uh, some of Zebra's value added apps are also affected. Data Wedge's ability to call start service, uh, I'd said has been curtailed there. They're, they are adding a new feature into Data Wedge, but they haven't added it yet. So I don't want to talk too much about that because, um, you know, commitments and timescales and everything. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, they are they are following Google's documented example of what to do if you call start service in your app. Let's just leave it at that. And then EHS have a, a similar feature and uh, I believe are doing a similar thing as well. So in order to test this app, this, these testing commands through Shell, so you can force your application to, um, you, you, to be run in the background. And obviously you can still see it, but it will behave as though it's run in the background. Just, I, I did, these were on all sorts of blog posts when Oreo came out, and I really struggled to find an official Google do, um, document that said these are the ADB commands that we have endorsed. Uh, eventually, I found it. It was in the middle of a, a YouTube video being released from Google. So these are official. Uh, if you're struggling to find an official source, then I did link to the YouTube video, I think, in my developer um, the, the, uh, portal post that I wrote about moving to Oreo. So the mitigation then, ideally, you want to move towards, I mean, I've said here the job scheduler API. I think that information is a little bit out of date. There's now a can't remember the name of it. it, begins with W, but there's a new API and it's like if if I'm running on Android API level you know, high, then it uses Job Scheduler API, else it will use a, a different API. But take a look at that Google blog that I linked to on the second or third slide and that will point you to the appropriate API. You can make use of the temporary whitelist if, you're, if you can move to Firebase Cloud Messaging or you're already using Firebase Cloud Messaging, then if your app is only performing background work when it gets a message, then you almost certainly will not be affected by this unless you're you know, kicking off some process that's going to last for several minutes. You could use a foreground service. Like I said earlier on, it's, that's not ideal from a user point of view unless they have a very good reason to look at your application. Google's, uh, sorry, to, to, you know, unless they have a good reason to actually see that your application is still running. Google have a recommendation, defer the background work until the application is naturally in the foreground, which again, might work for you. It, I, some people might say that that sounds like a bit of a cop out, but you know, it's uh, it exists. And honestly, that will be a very good way to have efficient use of the battery. If you don't need to do work in the background, then don't do it. Uh, or you could, like I said earlier, continue to target API level 25 and we'll come to the, the updated Play Store rules uh, towards the end of the deck. Uh, so finally, and this honestly, this is the bulk of the presentation. So we're, we've, we're near the end of these limitations. So the third limitation is a, a background application or service cannot make use of the Android location APIs, or if they do make use of them, they will only receive updates, quote, a few times each hour. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So unlike the previous two limitations where they only applied to API level 26 or above, which is Oreo or above, this, uh, an application targeting any API level will be affected by this limitation. The ability to, uh, for an application to determine its location based on Android APIs. So what's affected? We're looking, there's not a single uh, location API family on Android that as much as you know if you, if you do search for Android location you'll always get the fused location provider come up which makes sense and there's there's stuff on our developer portal of, about the fused location provider but there's also other APIs the the legacy AOA AOSP based location manager APIs uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that all of these different APIs to determine your location are affected 
by this change to uh, that's been introduced in Oreo. So the other API that was worth listing here is the Wi-Fi Manager Start Scan. So this will return nearby access points to you, and that will only do a full scan a few times each hour. So although it wasn't explicitly stated, I'm pretty sure that was done because you could, in theory, provide those AP SSID names to the Geolocation REST API, uh, and that will work on, on any Android or on any device, actually, it doesn't have to be an Android device, but that will that's a Google API and it will return back to you as a cloud service and you'll get back a lat long based on your nearby AP. So obviously now you can only do a full scan a few times each hour, you can only determine your location a few times each hour. So uh, the unaffected API, so these are the, the use cases or the APIs which Google are recommending and trying to move people towards. So geofencing, feel free to create your geofences. That's a very power efficient way to manage how your application knows, is it within a certain area or, or is it dwelling in a certain area? And you can define multiple geofences. It doesn't have to just be one geofence. Uh, so for a majority of use cases, that will probably you know, suit you rather than have to actually return the lat long of the device. There's a batched version uh, of the fused location provider. So the, for breadcrumbing applications, like where where was my user? Where did my user go? As opposed to where is my user currently? Uh, which, which can help with like tracing, maybe tracing a package or a delivery driver on a route without necessarily knowing exactly where they are at this exact minute. There's also an activity recognition client that can provide whether the user is walking, running, driving, cycling, that is unaffected. Uh, and also any API which was not listed on the previous screen, any of the, the non-Google location API. So I know there's been a lot of speak about the VLC capabilities, the light communication technology that you're now able to use on our new Oreo devices. That's not affected because that's as, as, you know, it's not a Google API, it's a Philips API, I think it is. And that's uh, available on our devices that will work, just like BLE location technologies will work, any of the Zebra location technologies, and there's there's more than just these two, but I've, I've called out worry-free Wi-Fi or RFID, any, any non-Google API will continue to work. Uh, so what Google are trying to do here is to lock down the use of the APIs to a specific set of use cases. And they see if you're running in the foreground, it's okay for you to know the user's location. So things like turn-by-turn -turn navigation, or if you're using Google Maps, you'll tend to have Google Maps on the screen and you can see where the uh, you can see your route. And so that Google Maps knows your location because it's in the foreground. Uh, Enterprise implication, I just tried to come up with a few kind of use cases which I've heard of over the years, things like real-time route planning for TNL use cases. You might have a separate app on the device which is looking at updating the real-time route based on you know changes to the delivery schedule that comes in. That would be affected because it's not running as the foreground app, so you might need to, to make changes to that because app, that app would also need to know where the device is. Things like find my device, where you want to be able to locate a device in, in real time, probably outdoors, because these are outdoor APIs um, in, in the main that we're talking about here. Uh, so that, again, that would be affected. Maybe you, you need to rely on historical data, or maybe you need to switch to a, a Firebase cloud messaging in that instance, or use a foreground service. I don't know. It's just, there's, there's lots of ways to address this, but it's just an instance that you might want to address. Talking about the mitigations, um, I mentioned foreground service. You could, if you're a, if you, if your app has a foreground service, it still continue, continues to be considered a foreground app by Android. So turn by turn navigation is the obvious example. There's a passive listener. Uh, now the passive listener enables an application in the background to, uh, to, to register for the, the, the best location known. And if there's an app also lo requesting location and running in the foreground, then the background application can piggyback on that request. And that's a way for the background app to continue to receive location. So think of the, uh, the example I gave just now where you had the, the TNL route planning application running in the background on the device. If that's using a passive listener 
and the use case is that the, the driver is using Google Maps for his navigation, well now the background route planning app can still uh, use the uh, can still use the location because it's used the passive listener and it is available to them. Uh, breadcrumbing is, uh, I've said you can use the historical location uh, provided through the batched location functionality and geofencing again, you know, consider using geofences, it is more efficient even if you're running in the foreground and your, your app is in the foreground all the time, it's easier and more efficient to use geofences rather than trying to uh, rely on lat long for you, uh, and determining a resolution between lat long and you know, geospatial um, awareness in your app. Let Google do the hard lifting, hard work, heavy lifting, combining the two. Uh, so I put this this uh, chart together. I won't read it all out, but again, this is another one of those uh, hero slides. If you take anything away from this presentation, then, then please take this away. I tried to summarize everything I was saying about background limitations in the previous in the previous part of the deck. Uh, so we're, we're going to speed up a little bit now in terms of features in, in Oreo and just cover each one in, in a, one or two slides. So notification enhancements, I said at the very beginning that notification was another feature which tends to change or get a new look or changes behavior in every new version of Android and Oreo is no exception. So now as a developer, when you create a notification, it's required that you give that notification an associated channel ID, which is an integer. And in doing so, the, what Android's trying to do here is to give the user more control or more granularity over what notifications it receives. Uh, it, it shows the user, sorry. And it's, it's really designed with consumer use cases in mind. So the, the example I've taken up here from I don't know if this was uh, from Google's website or my phone actually, but this is an app called News Digest, GMS app I think, which has 10 different categories. So 10 of these different channels uh, which it can present to the user. So it might be giving me the, uh, the technology news in this example here, or there might be another channel for royal baby news. And I'd be a lot less interested in one of them and more interested in the other. So I might choose to disable uh, the technology channel in order to only receive notifications about royal baby news. Uh, and of course, that, that's a very consumer focused use case. It's in the enterprise, we find that people are more concerned with, I want my user to always see my notifications, or I want to run full screen and hide all notifications from my users because I'm in a kiosk app. So the, the recommendation is still to use MX, and I've listed some of the, the capabilities we have there already. We haven't added anything specifically to only show specific channels of an application, because quite frankly, we don't see the use case there. Uh, and with any of anything I'm saying, if there are use cases that we haven't considered or that need to be added, then get in touch on the developer portal. We listen to everything that's said and we can you know, the, the more people that say it, the more likely features are to get into the system. Uh, notification dots, I, I mentioned briefly here, that only available on supported launchers and not, I don't think the launcher that we have on our Oreo device supports them. So you're, you, you wouldn't have dots uh, on, your, on your Zebra device launcher. It's possible to snooze a notification on Oreo. Uh, if you slide, then uh, previously in Nougat, this clock was not visible, whereas this clock is now new. And if you hit the clock, you can snooze for a, a period of time. I think you can snooze for one hour and you can change how long. The key here is that you, you can't prevent the user from snoozing your notification unless you make it persistent. And so if you don't want the user to snooze, then you know, make your notification persistent. Oh, excuse me. Okay, I'm back. Um, so moving topic, again, I said I'll, I'll go a little bit quicker now. Installing apps from unknown sources, this has changed behavior in Oreo. There's now a, uh, a, rather than previously in the developer options, we had a toggle switch for allow installation from unknown sources. Now you can choose the apps which can install uh, unknown source uh, applications. So uh, how, how this would typically be used on enterprise, to be honest, is you install your apps via stage now, or a minority of people might choose to install their apps through 
a, another app that they've written with EMDK. But most people would tend to use StageNow or um, increasingly the Play Store with, with managed Android. Uh, what is affected if you so all, none of those are affected uh, not affected is, is staged down all of that but you might find that the mx setting managers unknown sources parameter is affected so if, if your if your deployment involves you copying apks to the device and launching them through the file browser and clicking yes yes accept accept then that's the only kind of use case that would be affected by this so uh, check up on this documentation or allow the, the file browser install unknown apps permission. Picture in picture, introduced in Oreo and one of the, the headlines. Honestly, we do not see uh, strong enterprise use cases for picture in picture. Um, may, maybe things like Skype uh, or you know, you'll, maybe we'll get there one day, but there, there's not a lot of uh, our users clamoring for this kind of picture in picture functionality. Uh, we have verified that it works. You see our data wedge example our data wedge demo app does indeed work and can capture data when it's sitting behind a vlc running picture in picture on an oreo device it's a tour of our, our bangalore office i stole the screenshot from their um, sprint review we're an agile software engineering company obviously uh, and yeah it works but we we don't see a large number of use cases so beyond just validating that our our value adds work then you know but if you have identified enterprise use cases again that's an instance where get in touch if we need to do additional work and add new features uh, web view apis this is really really nice feature so on google chrome uh, ex you know before oreo if i tried to visit a dodgy website then i would be told hey you're you're going to visit a dodgy website darren i don't think you want to do that do you want to go back to safety uh, and that would uh, that would work you know it prevented me from going to dodgy websites what uh, google have added now is the ability to have that functionality in an application which has a web view component within it so previously you couldn't have it now it's possible to have this is that's called safe browsing so the safe browsing api is now available if you embed a web view within your app. Uh, so you can make you can take advantage of that today. And the enterprise browser product team telling me they are considering that for inclusion in an upcoming release, but I don't have any information on what version it, it will be in. But you know, have a look, uh, have a look down the line. I'm sure that will be added to enterprise browser in due course. Uh, Okay, so changes to the Play Store. This is another one of those slides where if you take anything away from this presentation, then I please uh, take this slide away from you. So Google have introduced uh, a change to how they allow you to publish apps on the Play Store. And when I say the Play Store, this applies to both the consumer play store and the managed play store equally it's it's the same underlying technology it's the same rules uh, so this this applies equally to both so today uh, applications newly added to the play store are required to target api level 26 so read that with the context of everything i was saying previously about background restrictions applying to any api any app which targeted api 26 or higher so that restriction is in effect today and i keep uh, when when the transition happened i got an awful lot of emails from the play store uh, in my associated uh, gmail account to say hey we are updating the the requirements so i'm presuming that a lot of people on this call who already have apps in the play store are aware of this change but it's worth reiterating here as well and then in november this year the existing apps that are already targeting lower levels cannot be updated unless the update is uh, also targets api level 25 or higher so just to clarify apps are not being deleted from the play store if your app targets api level 25 it can continue to exist in the play store untouched and, and unharmed but you just can't update it and you can't add new apps what's going to happen in the future each new year where that this uh, target sdk version requirement will increase and so uh, this is uh, certainly an, an area which you need to keep on top of and you need to continually update your target SDK version and you cannot use 
I'm just going to stay on an older version of Android in order to bypass some of these um, some of these limitations. So in the past, uh, a lot of customers would have said, well, that's okay because I am not using the Play Store. Um, you know, it, was, it was only used by a minority of, of customers because Android was not enterprise ready. And as I'm sure you're more than well aware, managed Android is very much a thing. It's being embraced by Zebra and Google and many other OEMs and EMMs as well we found an increasing number of customers who have either committed fully and they're, they're all in with managed play and, and managed Android, or they're just tipping the, putting their toes in the water, sorry, with managed Android. And certainly if we come back in, in a year's time, I expect there'll be uh, certainly a majority of customers have moved over to managed Android. It certainly is the way that, that things seem to be going at the moment in the Android enterprise space. Uh, so any of these, um, what am I actually saying on this slide there? Uh, yeah, so do, you can't just continue to target a lower SDK level. Even like in the past, things like in Marshmallow, people would still continue to target Lollipop so that they didn't have to deal with runtime permissions. And, you know, so it's, it's not like a new thing that's just come in in Oreo. This, this way of bypassing new features or new restrictions has been around a while. But uh, more robust workarounds uh, are given when I, if, if you read the blog post associated with this talk as well, have a look through that and hopefully that will give some additional mitigation. Uh, there will always be a, a portion of development that does not depend on the Play Store. I'm, you know, we're fully aware of that, but what my point is we see at the moment, uh, the percentage of, of uh, organizations targeting the Play Store to manage their applications will undoubtedly increase and all of those developers will be affected by this change. Very quick note on Android Enterprise features. Uh, there are documentation available from Google. I think this is a, a duplicate of that, one of those first slides, but just be aware that when Google talk about what's new in Android, they're, they're typically aiming their features at EMMs at this point, the enterprise mobility managers. They're talking about new APIs that device owners and profile owners can consume and add value to both the device and their EMM. Uh, but it is very important that developers are also aware of the changes coming in managed Android. The, the examples I normally give are you know, with, um, with whitelisting, uh, with whitelisting, you can specify a, a whitelist of applications which are able to run on the device, and you do this through the EMM or through the device owner, uh, and this is a feature of managed Android. Well, you need to be aware if you're using the camera or maps or the browser or any other app, you know, if you're calling out start activity or start activity for a result, and depending on the, the contacts app being there, if that's not been whitelisted, that's not going to run. Um, also, be aware of managed configurations. Uh, they're a really good way to configure your app if you're running in a managed Android uh, setup, then you can use managed configs to remotely control your app in a consistent and understandable way rather than have your app depend on some unsecured text file that's been that's been copied to the to the device. And uh, so I did want to briefly uh, add this slide in here. So there are changes coming in Pi. Obviously, the Pi has been released and the, the API is locked down. So just some of this stuff is coming up and it's never too early to, to rewrite your app or to be aware of changes which are coming in the future. If you've got things like reflection in your code or you're using the JNI, then just be aware that Android Pi is actively discouraging use of these methods, which is normally a uh, coded language for we're going to take them away in some future version of, of Android. So just be aware of that and all of the, the changes coming up. I don't, well, there's nothing from Zebra at the moment on Pi, but uh, there, there will be when we come to release our Pi devices, but we've only just released Oreo devices. So uh, give, give us a break. So in conclusion, uh, the biggest change in Oreo is background restrictions. The trend of restricting what an application can do in the background is continuing and likely to to continue into P and beyond. Um, any feedback you want to give on any of the features which I've discussed or any of the challenges that you see, how this will impact your enterprise deployment, because although we've released Oreo devices, 
recently. I uh, fully understand that many of our customers are still on Lollipop or Marshmallow or, or Nougat and won't be moving to Oreo for several months or maybe even a year. You know, it, these enterprises can be slow to transition. So we, it's always time to integrate feedback into the product uh, if enough people are asking for it. Um, and there is, I just put the link to it. Again, there's a long developer post accompanying this presentation where I go into a lot more detail at that link there on the developer.zebra.com portal, which leads us to the final slide and the link to the developer portal, please, if you need or if you want more information, more news, you can join our ISV program if you're an independent software vendor and offers some great benefits and I'm not best uh, best place to, to advocate the ISV program, but certainly uh, all the details are on our website and we can we can talk to you if that's an, an area that you're interested in. But other than that, I will hand back to Stacey if there's any questions, please. Thanks, Darren. Um, we have several questions. The first from Kelly, um, I can probably respond to regarding the links built into slides and where can I get them to click and follow. Um, this entire presentation will be up on the developer por portal on the blog post uh, regarding this dev talk.